Hello friends, uh, we are today discussing MAPC course block 3 personality theories part 2. I request you to recall the previous discussion based on the definition of personality as well as the developmental stages of personality. Uh, as against the normal practice of discussing infancy, childhood, adolescence, adult likewise, uh, it was deliberate that uh, a different system of developmental stages uh, have been discussed in the previous uh, presentation. In this presentation, we are focusing upon some of the major theories of personality. In the theories of personality, we have to discuss so many theories, but today, for time, because of time constraint, we are focusing only on two theories. One is called type theory. Type theory. In type theories of personality, is based on body type as well as uh, fluid type in, in, in our brain. Hippocrates, the ancient physician, uh, classified persons based on their blood, sanguinic, choleric, phlegmatic, like that. This, based on these characteristics within the body, the individual's personality may change, he believed. Then came the classification of Krashmar. Similar, it's a body type classification. Uh, he classified people as asthenic, athletic and dysplastic. The third one was Sheldon, Ernest Sheldon. I shall write the names here, Hippocrates. Rashmar and Sheldon. See, Hippocrates uh, is classified based on the and the body fluids, whereas Krashmar and Sheldon classified person persons personalities based on their body type by appearance. The aesthetic type as put by Krashmar, these are the three classifications made by Krashmar. The aesthetic type is a fat bulky person, uh, an easy going type of a person. The athletic type as the, uh, as the word indicates stout and a dominating person and dysplastic a slender type of a person. Sheldon, another psychologist, tried to classify individuals based on their body type and he believed that the endoderm of the zygote, you know, zygote is a fertilized ovum, transforms to the digestive system, belly and other parts of the body. The mesoderm transforms into the muscles and skeletal system. And the ectoderm of the cell transforms to brain, nervous system and skin. So the endomorphic personality, we will see endomorphic personality, mesomorphic personality and ectomorphic personality. See, people who are with a good belly, an easy going type of people, uh, these people are uh, belonging to the sendomorphic type. This mesodorpic uh, muscle men, or like I, I call athletes, and ectomorphic are slender, 
kind of introvert uh, personalities. You know, these types of classification, they don't have any scientific validity. Later on, so much of researches were conducted and no scientific substantiation could be obtained for any one of these theories. Especially psychology having got a scientific slant, depending upon some hearsay or some speculation, uh, cannot be access, accepted. We cannot depend upon them. So, more scientific approaches were looked into. It was at this time another entirely different approach was proposed by Sigmund Freud. Everybody knows last in our last presentation we have mentioned about the stages of development proposed by Sigmund Freud in the psychoanalytic perspective. Today we are going to see the major uh, aspects of personality, the postulates that Freud uh, upheld as the decisive factors in uh, an individual's personality. The, the, see, in his theory, his theory is centered around, I told you in the, my previous presentation, the libidinal energy. Libido is characterized by libido or libidinal energy. It is, it has two phases. One is called life instinct or erotic, erotic the second one is death instinct. This is called Eros and this is called Thanatos. According to Freud, life is a conflict and compromise between life instinct and death instinct. So on the one side, there is an erotic tendency, sexual in, 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 in tendency. The other side, there is a, an aggressive and a, a death-oriented thinking and tendency. This is manifested in many forms of behavior later on. He believed that the psychic structure has three aspects. The first one is called id. Id. Id refers to the innate, instinctive, inborn, impulsive tendencies and aggressive tendencies. It knows no morality. It is biologically conditioned. Yeah. Biologically conditioned. It is concerned only with the vegetative existence of the person. The pleasure-seeking impulse. Freud uses it is hedonistic. Hedonistic means the pleasure-seeking impulse, especially pleasure from stimulation of various parts of the body. It knows no morality, it is pleasure-seeking and of course everyone is to some extent pleasure-seeking. We are all narcissistic in a, another way. Narcissistic means self-love. Concerned only about our own pleasure, our own, our own body comfort. I told you to some extent we are all narcissistic. 
we love ourselves more than anything else in the world. Suppose you are given a group photo in which you are one of the members. You get the copy. Who will you look at first? Will you look at Bhairakshan Nambiyar or your classmate? You will first of all look whether you are intact, right? When somebody criticizes you, why are you getting provoked? Because we are all narcissistic. But when it crosses the boundary, it becomes abnormality. Right? So, hedonistic tendency, pleasure-seeking tendency, uh, this is the characteristic of it. It is functioning on pleasure principle. Yeah, I'll put it here. Pleasure principle. And functioning mainly in the unconscious. Freud's theory believes that there are three layers of mind. The conscious layer, which is... Which is only the peripheral part of it, the pre-conscious or subconscious just below that and the unconscious, the major portion uh, which is not accessible to our consciousness. Uh, he gives the example of an avalanche. See, unconscious is the, I mean, the reservoir of, reservoir of all the repressed, instinctive, uh, hedonistic, feelings, we unfulfilled desires of childhood. And this is it. We have to go to the next major concept that is ego. Part of the id later on transforms to ego. The ego is environmentally conditioned. Logically conditioned, ego, id. this is environmentally conditions. As a result of our interaction with the environment, the social and cultural realities, the physical realities, part of the id transforms into ego. And this ego is often regarded as the executive of personality. Executive of personality. This is an important assumption because if ego becomes weak, the entire personality will be uh, upset. Therefore, ego is not that uh, the, the, the term, term we use in literature in everyday life. We use it to say he is an egoistic person for arrogant persons. But it's not, it, this is different. Ego means, it is the reality perception. Ego, this sentence is very important. Ego stands for reason and circumspection, prudence and discretion. Reason, circumspection. Circumspection means inspection of circumstances. Two words put together, this is a portmanteau word. Prudence, farsightedness, and discretion. So that is ego. Therefore, ego is called the executive personality. Moreover, ego has another important function. The repressed unconscious content should not come into the conscious self. Ego guards it, protects it. Just like Cerberus. Cerberus is Pluto's dog. Pluto is taking guard of all the souls of the dead persons until the last judgment day. All the souls are kept in a dungeon. Cerberus is his dog. A very fierce three-headed dog. You might have heard about Milton's poem on melancholy. Hence, in low through melancholy of Cerberus and darkest midnight bone. Hey, melancholy, you are, the, you are the son of Cerberus and uh, 
a darkest midnight. That is Cerberus. What does Cerberus do? Taking guard of souls from coming to the out of the uh, dungeon. Similarly, ego is very vigilant and prevents this, the, the repressed, the forgotten and unfulfilled content uh, of these uh, desires dumped in the unconscious from coming out from the unconscious to the conscious. So ego is uh, uh, supposed to be function like Cerberus. And you know, it is working on reality principle. Principle. Look here, this is pleasure principle. This is reality principle. Looking into the surrounding center. Next concept is super ego. Super ego. Please take care that we are not spacing it. Super ego is one word. We can translate it into conscience. Part of the ego, later on, as a result of our interaction with parents, teachers, religious values, cultural values, part of ego transforms into super ego. Part of it transforms to ego, right? Part of ego transforms to super ego as a result of our interaction with values, with culture, with our teachers, with parents. And this is, I would, I would say, culturally and socially and culturally conditioned. Socially and culturally conditioned. It is a conscience. We experience guilty conscience. We have a prick of conscience, we used to say, because of the function of the superego. In some people, superego doesn't at all develop. They become psychopathic personality. They are not hesitant to commit any uh, brutal or uh, cruel activities. They, they fail miserably to conform to social norms. But there are other people in the other extreme. extreme. For silly things, they will get disturbed, they will be feeling guilty and the guilt may go beyond the boundary and they cannot even eat and sleep because of the guilt feeling. For silly things perhaps, for just an abhorrent thought, they will start disturbed. Uh, their sleep disturbances will be there. There is a phenomenon called finickiness and anorexia nervosa, so they cannot eat. So the personality problems like this are the result of the over-domination of superego. As we have seen earlier, superego is social and, and it is a conscience, conscience, and it is, it is based on value principles or moral and ethical principles. principles. So in, in, in uh, explaining in explaining the personality of an individual, the conflicts between id and ego, id and ego, there will be always conflict. It wants to fulfill something, ego thwarts it, ego checks it, ego prohibits it. Ego reminds of the consequences. Their conflict is nature. Conflict is painful. When there is conflict, the, the, the conscious level of mind cannot tolerate it. It is repressed down. And similarly, 
ego and super ego. This is reality, this is value. The ego is also selfish and pleasure seeking, but it is conscious about the consequences. Super ego prohibits that. Here also conflict is possible. So the function of ego is to maintain the balance between. So on the one side, super ego will be attacking ego. On the other side, it will be attacking ego. So ego has to maintain the balance between it embarrasses and super ego ideals. If ego becomes weak, personality itself becomes weak. This is one of the major postulates proposed by Freud. Now, now we, have, we have to incorporate the stages, five stages, psychosexual stages of development along with this because they are all interrelated concepts. Now there are three other interrelated concepts proposed by Freud. One is conflict. Second one is repression. And the third one is complexes. These are interrelated. Conflict we have seen. Id versus ego. Ego versus superego. Id versus superego is taken for granted. So this conflict. This conflict being painful is thrust down unconsciously to the unconscious processes. That process of forgetting, motivated forgetting, unconsciously forgetting. This process is called repression. Now Freud developed this theory. This is called the, the pivotal aspect of Freudian theory. The central aspect. Freud developed his theory in based on one of his experiences. Once Freud was checking his annual accounts and he saw that a, a female name was repeatedly appearing in the register. He tried to recall this uh, person. He miserably failed in recalling. This is unusual because in spite of attending several free association sessions, interview sessions, a person, a person is forgotten is unlikely. Why? He inquired it because he was, uh, say, a researcher. He was very keen in his observations. And he later on found that it was a lady who sought counseling and treatment for hysteria. In the process of treatment, this a lady on several occasions mentioned about some abdominal problems which he didn't pay heed to. He, he ignored it. He concentrated only on uh, hysteric symptoms and she was cured and discharged in the hospital. Later on, Freud happened to hear that this woman died of abdominal cancer. This news was a shocking news to him. He was a professional, a strict professional. He felt uh, guilty, remorse, and he wanted to forget it, eliminate it from the consciousness, this disturbing thought. Therefore, he forgot it. Not understandable, isn't it? You may ask me a question. Sir, will we forget or remember better when we want to forget something? Of course, this is an unconscious process. If there was any chance to recall her or to remind her, either her photograph or meeting her relatives in between or any other stimuli, stimuli that reminded her, Freud wouldn't have forgotten. So, there is a motive to forget. No inhibitions to you know, thwart that motive. 
unconsciously forgetting. This process is called repression. Many of our childhood experiences, unfulfilled desires, unthinkable thoughts, we call it abhorrent thoughts, are thrust down into the unconscious. That process, unconscious forgetting, is called repression. This is the central point of all the see, personality, the entire personality theory of Freud. Because every other concept is linked with that. And complexes. See, a liberal energy is directed to some objects. These objects are called cathexes. In male persons, mother will be the cathex towards which the psychic energy is discharged. Several experiences with mother and taking father as a rival for mother's love. Several such little, little experiences uh, repressed and in the unconscious, they get clustered, they become complexes. Freud talks about uh, Oedipus complex and in ladies, Electra complex. So these three interrelated processes leading into complexes eventually, culminating in different complexes. These complexes will manifest in our behavior, affecting our proper functioning of our personality. The next concept you have to discuss in Freudian theory is transference. You have seen that libido is directed towards a cathex. We have seen mother cathex or father cathex. And there is a very probability that this can be shifted to something else or someone else. Sometimes the libidinal energy usually directed to a male teacher will be transferred to a father. A, male, a father will be transferred to the male teacher. Freud's senior doctor, Joseph Brewer, had to stop practicing psychiatry because one of his patients, a, a fair lady, reported that she is very miserably in love with Brewer. And he was shocked by this, embarrassed by this. And uh, Freud took, the, took up the case and understood why this has happened. This is the process called a transfer. The, the, the lady found her own lover there, there, there were some, some experiences with the lover and to, this was discharged to the therapist. And this phenomenon, especially among children, school children, mother's affection will be sometimes shifted to, and the hatred as well, not only affection, hatred as uh, hating the mother, that will be transferred to the female teacher. This phenomenon, this is called transference. Another most important concept of Freud is that not only Freud, all the psychoanalytic theorists in, the, in this school, they all supported a concept called defense mechanisms. See, whenever the ego encounters with a situation, frustrating situation. We have seen earlier, conflicting situation. The ego can adopt two ways. One is the task-oriented 
defense. The other is defense-oriented oriented adjustment. Okay. So these are called adjustment mechanisms as well. Task oriented. Suppose, just an example. If a person uh, doesn't get a promotion, naturally he will be frustrated. What will he do? He can see why I didn't get a promotion. Was my performance uh, uh, not up to the level of expectation of my senior officers? Or could I do better? What measures I can adopt to perform better? This is a task oriented adjustment. The student failing in the examination. Why did I fail? Is it not my mistake? Why can't I refer to the previous question papers? Why can't I consult with my classmate who was a first rank holder? Why can't I go to the teacher concerned and discuss things? These are all task oriented defenses. Right? Task oriented. Ego's frustration is there. But this is a healthy person's way of meeting challenges. But look, look at this. There are so many defense mechanisms. When failure is encountered, the person can say, Oh, many of my classmates have failed. Only three passed. Here, he is identifying himself with the majority who failed. This is called identification. It's a defense mechanism. Identification. Or, he rationalizes. Rationalizes. Rationalization, it is called. He says, oh, because of my illness at that time, because of some other disturbances and many such things, he rationalizes. Actually, this rationalization is of two types. One is called Sour Grape Mechanism. The Aesop story, you, you remember. The other is sweet lemon mechanism. See, sour grape, when a desired goal is not achieved, we are justifying. Oh, because I need not explain. Everybody knows he's a story of the fox. Sweet lemon, when something unpleasant happens, trying to find, make some excuses to uh, pacify ego. Suppose the person mentioned earlier who seeks a promotion doesn't get a promotion. He says, oh, if I get a promotion, I will be transferred to some other part of the country and I will have to keep away from my family. Nice that I didn't get a promotion. Okay? This kind of justification, this is called rationalization. Repression is one of the ways for getting it. Denial is another way. And the only acceptable, I mean culturally acceptable uh, defense mechanism is sublimation. Our, these uh, feelings are sublimated into either to allow failure, uh, sublimated uh, to social service or the death of a very dear person thereafter writing poems, right? Uh, Picturization of this by, by a painter. Frustrations are thereby externalized. So, so many, there are about 20, 24 defense mechanisms. Even self-torture, it's called atonement, is a defense mechanism. Regression, going back to mother's womb, symbolic regression it is called. Repeat, repeating the, the childhood behavior. See, imagine a person who is 65 years, when he hears something, some news, good news, he is jumping and dancing and behaving like an adolescent. Right? This kind of regression. Repression. Aggression. Displacement. If I have anger towards, you know, I will give an example. There is a saying, a henpecked husband will be 
a very strict officer. In fact, a husband is being dominated by his wife at home. His, his, ego, his ego is disturbed by this treatment. He will compensate it. Uh, yeah, compensation plus displacement coming together. Displacement means instead of showing the, the hatred and the behavior to the, the uh, original person, shifting it to somebody, it's of course so many things. Transference also is there. Compensation. That is compensated. A student who doesn't get academically satisfactory records, he tries to compensate in sports. So there are so many such, uh, these defense oriented, these are substitute processes. This is realistic, healthy person. If a person is adopting so many these substitute measures, substitute measures, defenses to protect his ego, it crosses the boundary, he becomes an abnormal person. Not at all realistic. I hope now you understand why ego is regarded as the executive of personality. So having a stable ego with realistic perception, not being permitted to dominate by superego or impulses, through the different five stages of development, personality is shaped. If there is fixation in any stage, some abnormalities are evident we have seen in the last presentation. So we have to stop today's presentation and the next, in the next uh, class we will discuss humanistic and trait theories. Two, two more theories we will have to discuss. Thank you for patient listening. Of course, I expect your feedback. That is the motivating force. Uh, thank you very much.